Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harda Bayula, and this autumn I finished uh, the translation of uh, Robert Sheldrake's uh, Science and Spiritual Practices into Estonian. And today I have the unique opportunity to discuss the book and the, I the ideas behind it with the author himself. First of all, thank you for that. Um, mm. I thought for a while how to structure this conversation and finally decided for the approach where I will just read a few passages or short sentences from the book and, and ask you to comment on them. All right. So these excerpts are not really questions but more like invitations to talk about uh, mm. certain issues, although it was obviously curiosity that led me to your books and lectures in the first place. Mm. Mm. But before I start with the book, let me just ask you a short question of a more general nature. Are you a curious person, Dr. Schellerich? I suspect you are, but it would be interesting to... Well, yes, I think <laughs> so. I'm not curious about everything, but I'm curious about a whole range of things to do with biology, nature, conscious experience, and so on. I have very little curiosity in the technical details of motor cars, for example. Or, um, so there are some areas I'm not very interested in. Um, but uh, in the areas I am interested in, yes, I think I'm driven by curiosity. Mostly. Mm. Right. Um, uh, I'm I've, I've chosen these uh, sentences, like uh, mostly starting from the first, uh, from the preface, and and, and then w one uh, from the chapters that follow, it in the order that they they are they are in the book. And I'm particularly interested in in one episode where your curiosity led you to to the German literature of all of all places, mm. and in in the preface, uh, and I quote from there. <coughs> We killed the organisms that we were studying, dissected them, and then separated their components into smaller and smaller bits, until we got down to the molecular level. I felt that there was something radically wrong, but could not, ad but could not identify the problem. Then a friend of mine, who was studying literature, lent me a book on German philosophy containing an essay on the writings of Johann Wolfgang Goethe, the poet and Botanist. So, <laughs> well, that's the invitation to talk about that. Um, you were studying, you were studying uh, biology at that. Uh, yes, natural sciences. I was doing um, in Cambridge. You do several different sciences for the first two years. I was doing physiology, uh, medical physiology, um, botany, mm -hmm. um, biochemistry, and organic chemistry. Um, and so in, in the Cambridge system, you were in colleges with people doing all different subjects. So I had friends who were doing many different subjects. And uh, this was a friend who was doing German literature. And when I told him um, about, you know, my, I thought how limited I thought this kind of science was, um, he then drew my attention to this book of essays, um, and particularly the ones about Goethe which were extraordinarily helpful for me at the time because nobody had shown me any possibility of doing science in a different way. You mm -hmm. know, the English system is very specialized and the last two years at school, um, all I did was physics, chemistry and biology and Latin because at that mm -hmm. time well, you couldn't go to Cambridge unless you passed an advanced Latin exam. Uh, they stopped that in the late 1960s, but when I went to Cambridge, whatever subject you were studying, you had to show a high level of competence in Latin. So as well as studying physics, chemistry, and biology, I was writing Latin verse and translating from Ovid and that sort of thing. Um, so, but apart from that, there was, uh, there was no philosophy, no history. Uh, and. So I had no idea that you could do science in any different way. I, was, I just was taught one kind of science, and I thought that was it. And what reading Goethe showed me was that um, even in the early 19th century, he had felt that this kind of mechanistic science was too limited, that it was a very narrow focus. It cut us off from our own direct experience, and that a more holistic science could be possible. And of course, he worked in two main areas, the, the analysis of color and the perception of color. 
uh, which really nowadays one would say came in the realm of consciousness studies. Mm. You know, it's kind of phenomenological study of color, as opposed to just looking at wavelengths of light, mm. which is the kind mm. I'd been taught about. And the other area was botany, um, to particularly to do with plant form and morphology. And I was studying botany. I was Actually, botany of all the subjects I studied was the least reductionist. I mean, mm. the botany department at Cambridge in those days, it did involve actually going outdoors and identifying plants and going on expeditions and going into nature. It wasn't just about molecules. Um, so botany was the most uh, sort of holistically friendly science. Um, since then, they've changed it. They've turned it. They've changed the name from botany to plant sciences mm. and made it largely molecular. But when I was studying it, there were still quite a number of botanists who actually knew the names of plants and could. Um, um, you know, we went on field trips, and um, so botany was the subject that was most important to me, really, in the sense that it was one where the gap between the experience of the plant and the understanding was was narrower. With animals, we killed everything and ground ground them up, and you didn't pay much attention to the actual animal. Um, but in plants, we did pay some attention to the plants and. Um, Goethe showed how one could look at plants in a, a kind of holistic way. Um, so I found that tremendously helpful, and it, it opened for me, in my mind, the possibility of a different kind of science. And, and I thought, if I'm going to go on doing science, I want there to be a different kind of science, which is why, when the opportunity arose, I took a year off from Cambridge. I went to Harvard, where I studied history and philosophy of science to try and get a bigger perspective. Not many scientists do that these days, do they? But well, you can study history and philosophy of science as part of a science course at Cambridge. Uh, about 20% of scientists do it, but mm. that means 80% don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I could have done that at Cambridge, but my advisor said, oh, that's a waste of time. You need to get a really good grounding in science if you're going to do research in the subject, and that would just be a kind of self-indulgence and stuff. Mm. Anyway, I managed to have this year at Harvard, which was enormously important for me, because it enabled me to step back and look at the bigger picture of science in a historical and philosophical context. Yeah, and, and I felt the, 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 the seven years in India must have also been formative as far as the back general background of the ideas for, for this, and other your ideas, is, 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 that, well, is that true? Well, my time in India, <coughs> <coughs> That came somewhat later. I mean, um, after Harvard, I did a PhD at Cambridge, and then I was a fellow of Clare College, mm. Cambridge, and I had a Royal Society Research Fellowship. So I spent 10 years doing research on plants in Cambridge um, before I went to India. And the idea of morphic resonance, the idea of a memory in nature, uh, came to me while I was still working in Cambridge before I went to India. Um, but to think about science, biology more holistically was certainly easier in India than mm. in Cambridge because, you know, the, just the general cultural context is so different. I'm, everywhere you went in India, there were sacred trees and sacred animals and you know, cows in the middle of the road that all the traffic had to go around because they were sacred. I mean, uh, uh, attitudes to animals and to plants that were totally unfamiliar from mm. my European upbringing. Mm. Um, and uh, the Indian philosophy of consciousness and of nature is, of course, much more um, open to the idea of life being genuinely alive and consciousness pervading all things. It's a totally different philosophical perspective. So I... I found that really helpful as an atmosphere to live in, and I, I just love being in India, so um, I, it suited me very well. Right, well, let's move to the mm, spiritual practices then, and uh, the, the, uh, the quote I've chosen for that to introduce this uh, theme would be following. As I found with transcendental meditation, and as, I, as I've seen over and over again with Jill's workshops, people can learn spiritual practices and practice them without having to start by articulating their beliefs or doubts. Their practices, can their practices can lead to a deeper understanding, but direct experience comes first. I think that's the sort of key 
themes in that book, is it not? Yes, yes. Those are the key themes, really, the, the, because the point about spiritual practices is they lead to spiritual experiences. And experience is the key thing. You're, I mean, you can learn theories and you can learn facts from textbooks, and that's what schools and colleges teach for the most part, things you learn and, and write down in exams. And, um, and it's very left brain. It's about just articulating things you've learned. Whereas the basis of all religion, really, is, is direct experience. And Jesus didn't become uh, filled with the Spirit of God by studying at a seminary or... or just learning it from books, nor did the Buddha. He didn't become enlightened through doing a PhD. Um, he became enlightened through spending years meditating, sitting under trees. Um, and it was a direct experience that was so powerful for him and for Jesus and for other spiritual leaders. And I think for many people today, it's the direct experience which is so important. And many people have spontaneous mystical experiences, far more than used to be thought. Some surveys show that more than half the population of Britain have had these, and probably true in other countries as well. Um, the feeling of being part of something greater than oneself, one's own consciousness being part of a far greater consciousness. And spiritual practices are about uh, forming this sense of direct experience and connection, um, which is I think the most important starting point for people in in their um, in spiritual development, and of course traditional doctrines play a part, but in the modern world where many people start from an atheist or an agnostic position, uh, and have become detached from their traditional ancestral religion, usually Christianity or Judaism, um, then. Uh, practices are, the, are what matter and in fact the fact that millions of people in Europe and in North America do meditation now whereas two generations ago most people would never have even heard of it mm. and millions of people do yoga this is all about practice it's not about learning theories in books it's about actually doing things and the form of education that, that concentrates on practice is the workshop format of education as opposed to the right. academic type of education, which is not about experience, it's about learning facts. Um, and I've been much influenced in this by my wife, Jill, because Jill, for more than 30 years, has been teaching um, sound and uh, chanting workshops where groups of people, 20 or 30 people, spend a weekend chanting together with singing and chanting chants are like very simple songs that make it easier for everyone to join in. And this is a transformative experience for most people who do it. Um, uh, it transforms them because it makes their whole body literally vibrate, uh, resonate. Um, the whole group chants together, so it forms strong bonds within a group. And these chants are often mantras or sacred songs which provide a sense of connection to other spiritual dimensions beyond the merely human level. Um, so uh, what I've seen is that people can do these workshops starting from any point of view. Some people who do them are devout Catholics, some are Buddhists, some are Hindus, some are atheists, some are agnostic. Um, but it doesn't matter. You can do these workshops whatever your belief system, because it's not about belief, it's about experience. And through seeing Jill do this over many years, and through seeing the effects it has on people, um, I realized that practices, and learning practices and doing practices, um, is often very transformative for people. And so my book is really looking at seven different kinds of practice, all very different from each other. Um, all of which can have a transformative effect. And it's not a question of which one shall I do, because and I do them all myself. Um, I think it's a, a matter of they, they're all complementary to each other. They, in, all religions involve a wide range of practices, singing together, meeting in holy places, a sense of community, observation of festivals, rites of passage, rituals, um, 
and then things like fasting and pilgrimage. These are common to all different religious traditions. Um, so they each have their own particular collection of practices. Um, uh, but you, So you can do these practices as part of a religious tradition or independent of it, and uh, the practices themselves don't require signing up to a particular religion. Yeah, uh, the one sentence I particularly like that no, no religion has a monopoly on them, which, uh, which is... Your, uh, exactly, uh, yes, no religion has a monopoly on any of these practices, and rituals, one of the subjects I discuss in my book, all religions have rituals, and in fact, many national rituals exist, and but academic rituals like mm -hmm. graduation ceremonies, the most social groups have rituals, it's not just religions. And all religions have singing and chanting as part of them, and all of them have pilgrimages. So um, uh, these are practices common to all religions, and as, as you say, as you quote, you know, none, no religion has a monopoly on any of these practices. All right, let's move over then to the first um, uh, spiritual practice that you discuss in the book, namely meditation. And the quote I chose for that is that as follows. <coughs> Materialists deny as a matter of principle the existence of consciousness beyond the human level. They think of experience while meditating as nothing but changes within brains, confined to the insides of heads. So I think that's... Again, one of the key issues, I think, that materialists deny them as a matter of principle the existence, the existence of consciousness beyond the human level. Whereas all religions, as I learned from your lectures and books, take it for granted. Yes, all, uh, all religions, including shamanic religions in, in hunter-gatherer societies, take for granted the existence of forms of consciousness beyond the human level, spirits, ancestors, saints, angels, gods and goddesses, the role of those in Christianity, Judaism and Islam is more or less taken over by angels, mm -hmm. um, and then an ultimate consciousness of the universe. Um, so the existence of other forms of consciousness with which we can form direct conscious connections is just taken for granted in all these different religious traditions. And that's why materialism uh, at least uh, mechanistic materialism is different from all of those. Mechanistic materialism asserts that um, the whole universe is made up of matter or physical reality and that this physical reality is non-conscious. Um, it works mechanically like a machine on the basis of impersonal laws and impersonal forces uh, which have nothing to do with consciousness. Um, then, of course, the big problem for materialists is the fact that we're conscious. We ought not to be, according to the materialist theory. And the very existence of human consciousness is what's called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind. And many materialist philosophers try to pretend that we're not conscious or that it's an illusion. Uh, or at least, even if we experience consciousness, it can't do anything, because if it did anything, like acting on the brain, uh, this would interfere with physical causality, which mm -hmm. they regard as impossible. So consciousness does nothing. Now, according to for materialists, and many materialists do meditate. I mean, Sam Harris, for example, the so-called new atheist, in one of the new atheists in the United States, is now giving online meditation courses. Um, these um, materialists and atheists who meditate um, believe that the effects uh, scientifically uh, explained by changes in nerve impulses, patterns of activity in the brain, uh, neurotransmitters, and so forth. And of course, there are these changes in brains. There are measurable changes, as I show in my book. But is the effect of meditation nothing but these changes? Mm. Um, well, this is where the, the you can in, have the experience of meditation, you can have the benefits of meditation without actually thinking much about the theory of it, what's really going on. Um, but the reason that people develop meditation techniques in the first place in the Christian contemplative tradition, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in the Sikh tradition, in the Sufi tradition, the reason that all these uh, have developed meditation is because they think through meditation we can become closer to the ground of consciousness itself, 
which is part of the ultimate divine ground of being. And so they think meditation is a way of um, coming closer to this more than human consciousness. Um, and many people through meditation and through mystical experiences in general experience that they're connected with this more than human consciousness. Um, now, I suppose that some materialists and atheists experience that too, uh, but they would have to say that's an illusion. It's just to do with release of neurotransmitters, giving this oceanic feeling of being connected with another mm -hmm. consciousness. They'd say that's just produced inside the brain. Although the subjective experience is sort of... The subjective experience might suggest it's going way beyond the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I think in the end, everyone has to make a decision for themselves. If you have an experience that your consciousness is connected with a greater form of consciousness, you could accept that. It's a direct experience. It's important because it's something you actually know directly. Or you can say, no, I'm going to dismiss my own direct experience in favor of a theory, mm -hmm. in favor of a theory that all experience is, uh, in some sense, illusory or epiphenomenal. Mm -hmm produced by changes in the brain, and there's nothing but physical changes in the brain. At, at, at. Well, that's a theory. It's putting a theory ahead of experience. It's also a theory that's not very good at explaining consciousness. In fact, the weakest part of materialism is explaining consciousness. So it's, it, what it involves doing is putting a very weak theory, which is full of contradictions and problems, uh, a, a, ahead, uh, giving it greater priority than direct experience. And if people are very committed to a materialist worldview, then that's what they'll do. But the experience itself, I think, leads one beyond uh, that rather narrow philosophy. And I suspect that quite a number of materialists who've meditated long enough actually change their position and come to put more reliance on direct experience than on a theory that's very inadequate at explaining consciousness at all. Mm. Okay, the second practice, um, gratitude. Uh, we have, um, as you know, we have a collection of short clips on, on our website, and uh, by far the most popular is the one, three or four minute clip, which is uh, cut from your longer interview with Brian Rose, uh, which uh, is titled, Gratitude is the Key. and. Um, the quote from there, I which I like particularly, is that as soon as we as soon as we stop taking almost everything for granted, we begin to realize that we can be grateful for almost everything. And uh, I think one of the uh, quotes from you that I like most is that the gratitude, the opposite of gratitude, is entitlement. I think that's just uh, mm. that's applause, <laughs> applause mm. for that. So please comment on that one. Well, I mean, there's a lot in the modern world that encourages entitlement. You know, the idea is my right mm. to have fresh water and continuous supply of electricity and broadband connections and, um, and free health care and uh, people to look after me if I'm sick and stuff. All, and, and my right to be able to buy food at any moment, 24 hours a day, uh, from supermarkets where people have grown the food and carried it there and people are working in the shop and it's my right to have this because I pay money for it. Um, this attitude of everything being my right and, and also in an emotional level some people think that it's their right to be looked after by other people and for other people to be nice to them and so forth. Um, this sense of taking things for granted or feeling entitled um, leads to a mentality where if, the, if people don't get what they expect, then they complain. So the main response, if, so, if everything goes well, is to think, well, it's my right. Mm -hmm. it, I deserve this. I'm entitled to it. Um, and if things go wrong, then to complain um, that somebody, somebody's fault, that I'm not getting everything I need straight away. Well, gratitude is very different. It starts from the point of view that it's, it's not my right to be alive even. I mean, I, the fact I'm alive is because my parents gave birth to me and uh, the fact I'm alive now is because when I was a child, a baby, people looked after me and fed me when I could give nothing back. 
um, all of that was a pure gift. Life itself was a gift. The planet is a gift. The universe is a gift. I didn't deserve any of that, and it was all there long before I came into being. Um, and so, and then I could have had a much worse childhood. I, I, I could have been abused by my parents. I, my parents could have abandoned me. I mean, all sorts of things could have happened, but they didn't, and I feel very grateful that they didn't. I feel grateful that I had teachers who really helped me. I feel grateful that I've had food throughout my life when some people haven't, and that I've had medical care and attention. I mean, as soon as one begins to think about it, there's so many things to be grateful for, including just the existence of the Earth and the universe. I mean, if one, at the very minimum, um, the, the people who help make everyday life work, you know, the fact that people, farmers are growing food that I'm eating every day, I, I haven't grown hardly any of it myself. Um, people are delivering things to my house, people are, are supplying electricity, people are providing the means of heating, and all these things are um, coming to me just every day. And at, at the very least, I can feel grateful to all the people who make these things happen. So the more you think about it, really, the more reason there is to be grateful, the less reason there is to take everything for granted. And I think when one feels grateful, then there's a sense of being connected and part of a flow. Um, whereas if one feels one's the ultimate consumer, one takes things in but gives nothing back, then it's blocking a flow. And that usually leads to depression, unhappiness, a sense of isolation and separation. And the fact that depression is the endemic disease of modern secular societies seems to me perfectly understandable if one has a culture where it's just taken for granted that we're, we're entitled to everything. Whereas I don't think we are. I, I think oh. we, have, we have a huge amount to be thankful for in the modern world. That uh, The very fact we're in the modern world, despite all its faults, means we have dental care, health care, regular food supplies, the ability to travel around, communication systems, which people couldn't even have dreamt of a hundred years ago. So I'm also grateful to modern science and technology for all these benefits. Mm. Well, the next practice is, I don't exactly remember the, the, the title, but that's just a connection with a more than human world. And, mm. uh, so very intriguing uh, thought in at the end of one of the subsections. I'm glad I can ask a, a question about that and and hear your views on that one. Materialism is not solely a philosophical theory. Below the surface, it is an unconscious unconscious cult of the Great Mother. That's an interesting, interesting. Um, Would be uh, would be interesting to hear you to, to elaborate on that theme. Well, I think that you see what in in the early nineteenth century, when atheistic materialism was gaining in force and becoming more and more important, and until by the beginning of the twentieth century, it's kind of default position of most intellectuals. Um, what they were rejecting was the idea of a a god in the sky who designed the machinery of the universe and started the universe going, a kind of mechanical universe with God as a kind of external supernatural engineer. Now, a lot of people found that view of God incredible, and I do myself. I mean, if that's what God is, then I'm an atheist. Because I don't just can't believe in that kind of God. And so people said, no, we don't believe in this all-powerful God the Father. Instead, what we believe in is nature mm -hmm. and everything's explained in terms of nature not in terms of supernature the supernatural just the natural and um, the archetype of nature is of course mother nature nature mean natura in latin means birth and so nature is just the very word nature is is to do with birth and Clearly, birth is a feminine function, and men don't give birth. Um, so, Mother Nature is, is female, and so is Mother Earth in 
most cultures the earth is feminine, some the earth is masculine. You can have mythologies that reverse the normal polarity, but um, in, at least in the Latin um, family of languages, nature is feminine. In French, it's la nature. It's feminine. And Mother Nature is clearly a kind of aspect of the great goddess. In mm -hmm. most cultures, traditionally, there's an archetype of the great mother. And in India, for example, the great mother takes many forms. So one form of the great mother is the attractive girl. You know, this is sexually attractive woman. So there are uh, lots of images of goddesses who are young and beautiful. And this is a kind of Venus aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's the nurturing mother, the, the mother who actually is you know, feeding the child, the mother with the baby, the mother is the nurturer. And nature has that role in nurturing us. We depend on nature and the earth for our food and our water and everything we have. And then the mother is also the mediator of death. As some people put it, the womb is the tomb. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, when you die, you go back to the mother, the body is buried in the ground or burned and the ashes are scattered in the ground. Um, and so you return to the mother and there's a sense in which the mother is the death principle as well. And the, so nature has all these aspects and I think what happens for materialists, you see, is that they reject God the Father, put all their faith in nature, which really means mother nature. And then when you look uh, once you're aware of this, you find these archetypes everywhere. You see in the image of, um, in Darwinian evolution, nature red in tooth and claw, mm -hmm. which Tennyson, uh, the poet Tennyson, came up with that phrase. Um, nature red in tooth and claw creates by destroying natural selection, which is the primary creative force for Darwin, is creation through de death and destruction. Nature red in tooth and claw look at the images of the goddess in her destructive aspect, and the most dramatic of them is the Indian goddess Kali, who is literally red in tooth and claw. Her hands are dripping blood, and her teeth are dripping blood, and she has a, a garland of skulls around her. She's a destroyer. Um, but that's not the only aspect of the goddess, of course. It's just this one aspect. Um, and then in Neo-Darwinism, um, if you look at the Greek mythology about life, you have the three fates uh, who, um, uh, who spin a lot and cut the thread of life, dispensing to mortals their destiny mm -hmm. at birth. It's a key part of Greek mythology. And so the idea is there's a thread of life that dispenses to mortals their destiny at birth, and it's part of necessity or fate. And look at Neo-Darwinism, and sure enough, the thread of life that dispenses to mortals their destiny at birth is DNA. I mean, it's mm. curiously literal. Um, and the, the Jacques Monod, who wrote the, you know, the standard book on neo-Darwinism um, called Chance and Necessity, has these two basic principles that give rise to all life and evolution. Necessity is that which dispenses to mortals their destiny at birth, the fates or destiny. And chance is what gives random mutations and is the source of creativity. And again, in, in classical Greek and Roman mythology, chance is blind. The, the god and Roman goddess Fortuna is shown with a blindfold. She's blind. And uh, chance is blind. And Mono actually goes on at length. He says only blind chance uh, could give rise to this great soy sea of creativity that wells up from the depths of the well of chance. And, so, I mean, his imagery is implicitly about these goddess figures, never explicitly. He was probably quite unaware of it. Mm -hmm. But I think whenever we look for it, we see that actually underneath the surface of materialism is this unconscious cult of the goddess. And I have nothing against goddesses, but I think when they're unconscious, they can exert you know, a, a, a un a, an influence over people which is not always healthy. If, if they're conscious, then as soon as you're conscious and of this imagery and you realize that what you're saying is everything comes from the goddess, everything comes from the female principle, 
that this is an unbalanced view because it's obvious that if we're going to use gender in our mythologies, it requires at least two uh, genders, you know, masculine and feminine, um, to give rise to anything. Um, and in a sense, this is a reaction against a Protestant view of an all-male God. In the Catholic tradition before the Reformation, the Holy Mother looms very large. I mean, it's a major focus of Catholic devotion, the cult of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Holy Mother, who is also not only the source of life, but also in the nurturing mother, but also in sculptures like the Pieta, the mediator of Jesus' death. She's mm -hmm. there at his death, and, is this, and in fact, in the prayer, the Hail Mary prayer, the bottom line is, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. So she has all these aspects of the Great Mother, but the Protestants um, rejected the whole cult of the Blessed Virgin Mary mm. and, the, uh, and, and of the saints, really, and were left with an excessively masculine God, um, which provoked, I think, this atheist and materialist reaction, which has this uh, unconscious cult of the Great Mother. So there's a chance for us to get things better in, in, in better balance today, I think. Yeah, you, you do write about Reformation in... in in, in several places in that book, I think, at, the, at least in two chapters, I think, the issue of the Reformation comes up. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. But, uh, um, but the next, um, next, as you said, that the, the, uh, somewhere that the chapter on the more than human world would have been too long, so that the, the, the second, or the next uh, chapter is about the, uh, is about the relations with plants. Mm. And I think uh, the quotation I picked from there is um, is somehow uh, is clearly uh, linked uh, to the previous one and to the issues that we just discussed, and that's also quite uh, well, very intriguing for me. God is not like an engineer who creates a separate mechanical world. We just talked about it uh, a while ago, as some um, uh, mechanistic theologians suggested. God is within the natural world, in every part of it. And the natural world is within God and participates in God's being and consciousness. So this is panentheism, isn't it? Not? Mm, yeah. Please uh, talk us about that. Uh, and it just rem reminds me of the series of lectures you delivered on, um, uh, in, in the spring that I was uh, lucky enough to attend. And you mentioned there that um, three trends towards the reanimation of nature, which was one is the concept of fields, another is development psychology, and the third is revolution in theology, that we're talking about that now, right? Mm. Please. Well, I think that the, the, the <coughs> there have been a whole, rea if we look at the history of Western theology, which is Christian theology essentially, rooted in both in Jewish um, theology and also in Greek philosophy. I mean, those are the two main roots of Christian theology. Um, the, the Greeks, and like almost all traditional people, had a view of nature as alive, of the, the earth as alive, the stars and the planets as alive, the whole universe as a, like a living organism, um, and plants and animals as truly alive. And this view of nature as alive is usually called animism, and it's what underlies all shamanic cultures. It's in Greek philosophy, in the philosopher Aristotle worked it out in a kind of sophisticated detail. Um, all plants and animals have souls. Animism comes from the Latin word anima, soul. Um, and Aristotle was quite explicit, all plants and animals have souls. And the in the Jewish world, it was the idea that nature is alive was taken for granted. I mean, there are lots of psalms about the hills clapping their hands with joy. I mean, the whole of nature is animated. Um, it's not dead and mechanical. And in the Middle Ages, the um, great synthesis of, of medieval philosophy between Christian theology and Greek philosophy was carried out mostly by St. Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas, in the 13th century, uh, takes the Aristotle's view and says, yes, all plants and animals have souls, the earth has souls, the planets and stars have souls and intelligences, the whole universe is alive. 
And that was the standard Christian view that was taught in all the medieval universities. And it's the worldview out of which the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe came forth, Chartres and Lincoln, Salisbury, you know, the, these great Gothic cathedrals that um, are still some of the most impressive buildings in Europe came out of this medieval synthesis where there's vegetative themes, there are leaf shapes, there are animals in the carvings, green men, these spirit men, nature spirit figures, men with leaves coming out of their mouths. Um, this was an animistic world that gave rise to those great cathedrals in that medieval culture. The change happened most dramatically in the 17th century with the uh, birth of mechanistic science, which says, no, that's all wrong. Um, Nature is made up of machinery, which is inanimate. Matter is unconscious, inanimate. The whole universe is mechanical. The heavens are like a kind of gigantic clock. Animals and plants are just machines. The human body is just a machine. Um, the only things that are not machines are the spirit of God and angels and human minds. And this is called Cartesian dualism because it was most clearly put forward by Descartes in the first place. Um, anyway, this then led to a kind of theology where God's outside nature and God became a machine maker or engineer creating a mechanical universe that functions automatically. And then people said, well, if the universe functions automatically and once it's been started off, you don't really need a God to keep things going or um, you know, it becomes increasingly superfluous. In the beginning of the 18th century, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Laplace in France and others said, well, we can get rid of the idea of a God being necessary to create it by just saying the universe is eternal. It's always been there, matter's been there, the laws have always been there. You can get rid of this creator God. You've got a completely mechanical universe. Then people who retained a belief in God had to think of God as outside nature, intervening through human minds and possibly angels and primarily concerned with human morality, but not involved in the natural world, which all work mechanically, as described by mechanistic science. Well, then, I think what's happening now is, is so interesting because we've got a, a new growth of animism or um, panpsychism. Panpsychism is the belief that, or doctrine, that there's a kind of psyche or mind throughout all nature. And the reason that many philosophers and neuroscientists are taking up panpsychism today is to deal with the hard problem of human consciousness. If only humans are conscious, then something miraculous seems to have occurred in a non-material, in, in a material universe. Whereas if you say that even electrons and atoms have some degree of mind, then the emergence of minds in human brains is a difference of degree, not of kind. And so that's one reason for the growth of modern panpsychism. And then you can go on beyond the Earth and you can say, well, what about the sun? Is the sun conscious? And are all stars conscious? Well, why not in a panpsychist universe? Is the galaxy conscious? Is the whole universe conscious? Well, again, in a panpsychist or animist universe, it, the only answer for that really would be yes, the whole universe must have a kind of mind. But then that would be a form of uh, a, a, a theology called pantheism. Pantheism is that nature has a mind, but there's nothing beyond nature. Um, whereas most traditional views of God are that God transcends nature as well as being within nature. Um, and so the, the view that says God is indeed in all nature, as in pantheism, um, but God is also beyond all nature, as in theism, um, and this panentheism means God is everywhere, pan, and in um, everything, n, is, it means in. But nature is in God as well, so nature is in God and God is in nature, that's panentheism. And that's much closer to the medieval view and the traditional view than to the either the mechanistic view or a pantheist view. And it may seem that the distinction between pantheism and panentheism is fairly trivial, but actually I think it's quite fundamental. 
if you think of our own bodies, um, our minds are concerned with our bodies and related to our bodies. So when I'm hungry, I look for food. Um, you know, these, the, the, our bodies influence our minds. When I'm thirsty, I want something to drink and look for something to drink. So do other animals. Um, so if our minds were entirely concerned with our bodies and didn't transcend them, they'd always be about bodily needs and bodily desires, sex, food, drink, um, and, and, and social status and so forth, um, social desires as well. But um, there's a great deal about our minds which transcends all these things. Within science, for example, we can think about galaxies outside our own. Now, that's got nothing to do with food and drink and sex, only insofar as if you're paid to be an astronomer, you have an income from... But for those of us who aren't paid to think about the rest of the universe, uh, the very fact we can think about galaxies beyond our own, and now in modern cosmology, in even universes beyond our own, a lot of cosmologists believe in multiverses with countless other universes beyond our own. Their minds are transcending this universe by compostulating other universes. And so if there is a mind that permeates the whole of nature, uh, that mind too may permeate, uh, may transcend this universe, conceive of other universes, contain other possibilities that are not yet expressed in this universe. And that would be a transcendent aspect of the divine mind, not just an immanent, i.e. within nature. Mm. So panentheism is saying that God is both transcendent and immanent. Pantheism is saying God is just immanent. Old-fashioned mechanistic theism is saying God is just transcendent. And atheism is saying God doesn't exist at all and is neither immanent nor transcendent. Mm. So in a sense we have a sort of revival of Aristotelianism. Yes, I think so, because I think through um, the, the we through this pan psychism we've got something that's much closer to traditional Aristotelianism. But Plato also believed that the world of spirit and the world of forms permeated nature. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get into this you find classical scholars saying, Oh well, Aristotle was really a Platonist and other people saying no he wasn't and um, there's, a, there's a whole academic literature on this. Right. But nevertheless, this modern view and the kind of views I hold myself are much clearer, uh, closer to Aristotelianism, really, than right. Platonism, at least as traditionally understood. All right. Well, let's move on to the next spiritual practice, which is rituals, rituals and participation therein. And the thought I picked up from there is that, um, I like that as well, Rituals are part of all our lives. We cannot live without them. But we have a choice over rituals we take part in and the spirit in which we do so. They can be dull and habitual, or they can be enlivening, inspiring, and spiritually rewarding. Would you? What would you add to that one? <coughs> well, what I was th when I was thinking about everyday ones that we all take part in, I was mainly thinking of rituals of greeting and parting. Yeah, that's come from that uh, section. And we always have um, these rituals when you say hello or goodbye. Um, there, there's certain ritualized forms of greeting, you know, handshakes, hugs, kisses of greeting. Um, these are part of normal life uh, for everybody, not just for religious people. They're just part of normal social life. All societies have them. And the traditional rituals that we've inherited are usually ones that involve prayers for um, giving a blessing to a person on parting um, and, as it were, praying for their well-being and preservation. The English word goodbye is a, a shortened form of God be with you. So every time you say goodbye, you're saying God be with you if you're conscious of what you're saying. Otherwise, you're just saying the words. But, you know, a few centuries ago, people would have said, God be with you, or God bless you, when you parted. Uh, bringing God into the ritual, not just a, a secular greeting. And those greetings in, in languages where it's, like in French, au revoir, or arrivederci, or um, in Italian, these are about 
seeing seeing you again, au revoir, until we see each other again, um, is implicitly a prayer for preservation and, and for the person being safe, for both of us being safe until we meet again. So I think that these there are these everyday rituals like greeting and parting. And then there are all sorts of other rituals which are more, there are ones to do with rites of passage, there are ones to do with festivals and times of the year, there are ones to do with um, religious ceremonies, there are many, many other kinds of ritual. Um, but we can't really lead our lives without rituals of some kind or another. And uh, they can be life-giving and life-affirming um, if we appreciate what's going on, otherwise they're just unconscious habits. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, the sixth practice is singing with other people, and the sentences I picked up from there are following. For people who believe that consciousness exists only inside brains, the vast majority of the non-human world is theft over chants, songs and music. On the other hand, if the entire cosmos is conscious, and if it contains many levels of consciousness within it, then the music can link us to the musical minds far greater than our own and ultimately to the source of the life itself. That's I found the chapter on music particularly interesting because my I'm not well my I have no prior musical education and it was interesting to uh, interesting to um, interest particularly interesting for that reason only, only mm. but. Um, Again, please elaborate. Well, I think the, uh, you know, the Greeks used to believe in the harmony of the spheres. They believed that each of the planets as it moved around was emitting a tone mm -hmm. and that together they added Harmonia up to mundi. a kind of, yes, a harmony. They thought of them giving off kind of static harmony. But uh, th when Kepler in the 17th century found the planets moved in ellipses, then it became more polyphonic. And Kepler was very interested in the whole idea of mm -hmm. harmony of the spheres. Originally, he thought that the planets moved in a completely um, sun-centered geometric form in circles. But when he discovered they move in ellipses, um, not in circles, this meant that the tone they admit, because they speed up when they go around the sun, mm -hmm. and they become slow when they go further away. Um, More variation then. That, so the tone would change and mm -hmm. the speed of movement. and So the, then the, the whole solar system would become polyphony, polyphonic with different interwoven sounds. And polyphonic music like in 16th century church music like Palestrina, Victoria, Talis, Bird, um, is music where each part has this equal weight and equal importance, and they weave in between each other. The music of Bach is largely polyphonic. Um, it, it's in that sense, it's rooted in the, this older tradition. Of, and so this is a vision of a kind of polyphonic uh, moving music rather than just static chords. Um, and everything in nature is rhythmic. Um, we now know that everything, you know, atoms, molecules, uh, are all rhythmic patterns of vibration. Mm. Our own bodies are highly rhythmic, and we have the rhythm of breathing, the rhythm of the heartbeat, the rhythm of the brain waves, the rhythm of the biochemical reactions in our cells, daily rhythms of sleeping and waking. Um, the planets and the stars have rhythms. Galaxies have rhythms. They, they're all rotating. The stars are all rotating around the galactic center, and um, they're moving. And um, so. Everything in nature is actually in movement and in rhythmic movement. And rhythmic, uh, th we hear only a small band of sounds, of vibrations between frequencies of, what, 50 hertz and 800 or whatever. I've forgotten the range of our hearing. But it's like in the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, we only see a narrow band uh, with our eyes, you know, from blue at one end to ultraviolet to infrared and all the colors in between and then there's all sorts of invisible radiations which are all there it's just we can't see them with our eyes you know infrared um, gamma rays x-rays radio waves etc etc 
And the same with the, uh, we can only hear a particular range of vibrations which are the only ones that become music for us, um, which are the range within our auditory range. Um, but if there are other forms of consciousness, which is what I'm alluding to in that passage, throughout the universe, the, a mind of a galaxy, a mind of a solar system, then they'd be working on completely different frequency scales to our own and be conscious of them. And it may be hearing all sorts of music we can't hear. Um, the idea, the, the normal idea is we can hear music in this range. Animals can hear it in slightly different ranges, but otherwise the whole universe is deaf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, for the many forms of consciousness that can respond to these frequencies, then the, there may be a kind of musical quality to the consciousness of beings and organizations, levels of organization all through the cosmos. Um, so we can't really imagine forms of music beyond those that we know of, but we can imagine that they may exist and there may be other forms of appreciation of music all through nature, and that our music points beyond itself. I mean, one of the things about the music of Bach, for example, is that you get the feeling that this is not just about human desires and emotions. And it's about something much bigger than the, mm. it's about the more than human world. And that's true that's of all that's sacred That's what music. makes the music so great. Exactly, and that's true of all sacred music in all traditions. Every single culture has music which is pointing beyond the human level to something beyond. And that makes much more sense if we think of other kinds of mind, which are also musical throughout the universe and even beyond it. And well, we've reached the last spiritual practice, which is pilgrimages. And, um, and the short sentence from there. The contemporary awakening of pilgrimage in Europe is remarkable. As societies become increasingly secular and materialistic, this ancient spiritual practice is undergoing an astonishing revival. What would you add to that one? Well, I mean, I think this is simply a sociological and historical fact that there's this remarkable revival of pilgrimage. I mean, Santiago de Compostela in Spain is really the, the point where the, the balance tipped. And when that pilgrimage was revived in the 1980s and has become increasingly popular, attracting people from all over the world, um, it's helped to trigger off a revival of pilgrimage in many places, like the pilgrimage in Norway to Trondheim, to the, to the cathedral and the shrine of St. Olaf. And that was revived, what, 10 or 15 years ago and is now a major pilgrimage route in Scandinavia. And there's um, been a revival of pilgrimage in France where it was suppressed at the French Revolution. Um, a big revival of pilgrimage in Russia where pilgrimage was suppressed under the communist regime. Um, and here in Britain, um, the British Pilgrimage Trust is helping to revive footpath pilgrimage routes to Canterbury, which was the most important place in the Middle Ages of pilgrimage in England. And also recently um, a series of one-day pilgrimage routes to all 45 cathedrals in England. Um, and so you, there are now long pilgrimage routes, short pilgrimage routes, some that take two or three days, some that the Mount Canterbury route takes 19 days. Um, and uh, the, these, this is proving very popular with people of different ages and of different backgrounds. And the British Pilgrimage Trust, um, in the guided pilgrimages that are led by members of the Trust, has a slogan, bring your own beliefs. <laughs> um, to emphasize this is not about belief, it's not primarily about your belief system. It's about the experience Practice. of walking through the countryside, connecting with nature, going to an ancient sacred place, where, which is a, traditionally a portal, an opening between heaven and earth, and connecting with that sacred pl place and going with an intention. So it's deep, ancient, and archetypal, this practice. And yet it's wonderfully relevant today and is undergoing this revival all over Europe. So um, I think there's no better way of expressing a spiritual quest than going on a pilgrimage because you're literally going on a journey 
towards a sacred goal, and a goal which unifies heaven and earth, or unifies the, 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 you know, the people in time, because many have been there before you, and you're connecting in time with those who've been before you, connecting in space with the down into the earth and up into the sky. It's a, literally a joining place of heaven and earth. And you're connecting with your own spiritual nature and the more than human spiritual um, presences that connect on and through it. So I see pilgrimage as a, as a wonderful example of a spiritual practice that anyone can take part in and which has great benefits. Some pilgrimages are explicitly about healing, like the pilgrimage to the Shrine of Lourdes in France. Um, but many pilgrimages have a healing effect on those who do them. So, um, you know, I think that, the, and again, this is something that happens in all traditions all over the world. We're taking part not just in a kind of European practice. If we do it in Europe, we're taking part in an archetypal pattern of behavior that's found in every culture, mm -hmm. everywhere. And one of the points about all these cultures is that you have to relate the spiritual dimension to the place mm -hmm. where you are. Um, so if we're in England, um, it's important to rediscover the holy places of England and, and, and reconnect with them. Good to go to Santiago or to Trondheim, but the real challenge is to find ways of doing it where we are and resacralizing our own land mm. um, and reconnecting with it. And I think this is also very relevant to one of the big political issues of, of our time, which is to do with migration. And when people migrate to another country, they usually think of the sacred places as back home. You know, if an Indian migrates to England, then for them the sacred places are like the Ganges, Mount Kailash, the great temples of India, and so forth. Not English places, because they move to England, they usually live in cities, they don't go into the countryside very much. Um, and I think that to, the, to find roots, to really rediscover roots in their country where they now live, going on a pilgrimage is a great way to do that. Interestingly, this is already happening. When I was in Switzerland recently, I was visiting Basel, and my host there said, we've got a free afternoon, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to go to a sacred place, maybe the cathedral in Basel. And he said, well, now I think you might be more interested in this shrine of the Blessed Virgin at Mariastein. So we went to this little village in the mountains of Mariastein, and there's a black Madonna in a cave, and there's a beautiful small church, and then there's a kind of tunnel goes down the side of a gorge um, to a cave, and in the cave is this image of the black form of the Blessed Virgin, a very archaic form of the, the Great Mother. And I was surprised when I got there to find about half the people who were in the shrine as pilgrims were clearly a South Indian. In fact, they were speaking Tamil. Mm -hmm. um, and I said to my host, that's strange, what are the Tamils doing here? And, <laughs> and uh, then I looked up and on the wall there are these plaques where people give thanks for healings and things that have happened there. And there were dozens of plaques in Tamil. And he said, oh, well, he said the Tamil population in Central Europe had discovered this place, and for them, it's a shrine of the Great Mother, uh, the Holy Mother, and they come here on pilgrimage, and they've made it this place where it's a major place of Hindu pilgrimage, as the, the shrine of the Great Mother, and and they're giving thanks for their visits, and and they were behaving very reverentially, and they were lighting candles and saying prayers. So this is an example you see of. Now, they had found a way of living in Europe and connecting with the land of Europe, which I think is very important. Mm -hmm. If they're going to live in Europe, it's important to connect with the land and find the holy places. Otherwise, you're always an alien, a stranger. If your holy places are not where you live, they're somewhere else, far away. If you're going to really live there, if you're going really to connect with the land of the place where you're living, then you have to connect with these places. So this process is already beginning for, for Hindus are probably the people who find it easiest to assimilate um, to other religions and traditions. But this is happening quite spontaneously already.
probably happening elsewhere in Europe as well. Right. In the last chapter, you mm, sort of pull the threads together, and uh, the the lines are picked from there. Um, as follows: Historically, modern atheism grew out of the Christianity, and as the philosopher John Gray argues, it is best seen as a Christian heresy. That's an interesting, uh, that in interesting take. Uh, Gray, uh, uh, John Gray was very important for me as well. A couple of what ten years ago when I started to read him. So I haven't read the Seven Types of Atheism or that. Yes. Well, but Gray is a very good book, Seven Types of Atheism. Gray is himself an atheist. Um, and is, I think, the most illuminating writer on atheism today. And no one can accuse him of being polemically anti-atheist because he's one himself. But what he shows is there are different ways of being atheist. And the least interesting one, from his point of view, is the kind of Richard Dawkins-type mechanistic materialist atheist. These are the commonest kind. People who say, I believe in science, I don't believe in God, and science shows nature is nothing but inanimate matter following physical laws and, and the, the kind of standard a common or garden atheist view that all of us encounter among acquaintances and friends very commonly. Um, now that kind of atheism you see is something that grew up as a result of this Christian process. I think that the you know the first step is the Reformation and in the Reformation the Protestants spend a lot of time attacking Catholic practices. They get into the habit of being critical of religious practices, saying mm. they're nothing but mumbo-jumbo, and there are all these ridiculous superstitions that foolish people believe in. So Protestants were leading the, the, the attack on Catholic, destroying Catholic shrines, suppressing pilgrimage, uh, rejecting many rituals, rejecting the cult of the saints. Uh, rejecting the cult of the Holy Mother um, in the interests of purifying the Christian religion. But in so doing, they, they unleashed a kind of critical spirit where you feel you're superior to most other religious people if you adopt a Protestant point of view. If you're a Protestant, all these Catholics are just superstitious. They've been brainwashed by priests and that sort of thing. Well, then, um, if you then have that kind of way of thinking, and together with mechanistic science, which says nature is not filled with spirits and saints and holy shrines, it's just inanimate machinery, fitted very well with this Protestant mm. worldview, disenchanting the world, desacralizing nature. Um, this then sort of, together with this Protestant spirit, um, can then lead to the idea, well, there's absolutely no need to believe in God because God just started the world machine in the first place and then we can just get rid of him by um, saying the universe is eternal. But this kind of atheism is, is rooted in uh, a Christian tradition. And um, the very fact that there's a universal science that you can use to attack this idea of God is itself something that grows out of a Christian tradition. The idea that nature could be studied as a whole, that it's governed by unified laws, all of that comes out of Christian theology in the first place. It's not self-evident. Um, so, and, and, and Christianity is the religion that's led to, more to atheism than any other. I mean, the great majority of atheists today are people from Christian backgrounds. You don't meet that many Muslim atheists or Hindu atheists. And Jewish atheists are very Jewish. I mean, Jewish atheists may differ in their view about God and God's nature, and some may say there is no God, but many of them still have their children undergo rites of passage like bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Many of them observe the festivals, Passover, Yom Kippur. Um, many of them observe uh, the Sabbath as a family meal together. So um, Jewish atheists remain much more Jewish than Christian atheists uh, remain Christian, although even Christian atheists are very uh, likely to observe Christmas as, as, as a major festival. Um, which, of course, has pre-Christian roots. Um, so I think it's uh, an interesting way when we look at the history of this kind of atheism, that it is specifically um, a Christian history. And 
Atheists differ according to their background. I mean, there's a famous joke about someone in Northern Ireland, you know, meeting someone who says they're an atheist. Says, yes, but I mean, are you a Protestant atheist <laughs> or a Catholic atheist? It makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the the atheist um, that kind of atheism is 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 different from some other kinds that uh, John one kind of atheism that John Gray discusses is a kind of mystical atheism, and I, he himself I think fits into that category. Mystical atheism. Mystical atheism. Because they should read that book. Uh, well, the mystical atheism is where <laughs> it's actually a kind of theology which is common, especially in the East and Orthodox Church, it's called apophatic theology. Mm, okay. mm, apophatic okay. theology says God, by definition, is beyond all human conception. If there's a great consciousness that includes all of nature and, and transcends it, it's obviously going to be vastly greater than the limited human mind. And human minds, therefore, can only form the most inadequate conception of God. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all our views of God are going to be unlimited, uh, are going to be limited and inadequate. Um, and in apophatic theology, what they say is, we can really only say what God is not, but what not what God is, because God's being transcends everything we can conceive. Um, and so, that can lead to a kind of atheism where you say that any conception of God, any imagery of God, any theology of God, is much too limited because if there is a consciousness beyond all nature, um, it almost certainly can't be fully comprehended by human minds. Therefore, all human images of God are limited. And you, you can then say, well, I reject them all because I don't believe in any of these because they're all much too limited. But there's something beyond all this which I do believe in which can only be experienced directly not conceived or formulated intellectually. And that's a kind of mystical atheism. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, that kind of atheism is actually quite close to mystical theology, especially in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so I think John Gray's own atheist position is much closer to that, rather than people who say, well, we now know that the universe doesn't need God because it's all just a matter of atoms and molecules and physical forces. The, the scientific atheism that we're all most familiar with. Anyway, he shows there are seven different kinds of atheism. It's a very interesting taxonomy. Right, so we've reached the last quote that I've picked for today's conversation. And this actually doesn't come from uh, science and the spiritual practices. It comes from your book, um, Science Delusion, mm. which is also uh, available in Estonian. It was also your first book that was translated yeah. into Estonian a few years ago. And the reason I'm, uh, I picked that one is that uh, I've also been thinking, of course, everybody thinks what's, what are the roots of our modern predicament, um, which seem to be growing uh, worse by, by, by year. And that's a very interesting uh, angle on that one. And uh, I'd like to hear your, finally, your, your views on that one. This division between public rationalism and private romanticism has been part of the Western life for generations, but it is becoming increasingly unsustainable. So that's the that's very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting contrast. Please, could you yes. Well, the background to that is, of course, as I explain in the Science Delusion, that this mechanistic materialism, which became quite predominant by the end of the 18th century. I mean, the, the rationalists of the Enlightenment put, they believed in science, reason, and human progress. That's what they believed in. And they were against religion because they thought religion held people back, and whereas this would lead people forward. That was the spirit underlying the French Revolution and the Enlightenment and Enlightenment philosophy. Um, but they conceived of nature as mechanical, inanimate. Um, and this led to a reaction in the Romantic movement at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century, where the Romantics said, no, nature isn't like that. We have feelings when we go into nature, into landscapes. We have this sense of tremendous awe. There's a spirit, a presence, which is not just inanimate machinery. And we have emotions. We're not just inanimate machines. We have emotions. We have imaginations. There's much more to life than just inanimate machinery. 
So the Romantic movement was really expressed through the arts and uh, through poetry and novels and Romantic painting and literature. And in fact, Goethe's views on nature as being more holistic and alive, with which we started our discussion, really come out of that Romantic reaction against mechanistic science. And that romantic tradition is part of our culture too. So the, the point I'm making there is that during working hours from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, most people go along with the mechanistic worldview because that's what we're educated to believe in. It's what underlies business, commerce, government, education. But then at weekends and at home, um, people are much more romantic. You know, they keep dogs or cats, and they believe their dog or cat is a true living being, not just a machine. <laughs> they recognize it has emotions. It often has psychic sensitivities, knows when they're coming home. Um, they garden. They like being with plants in the gardens. At weekends, they go walking in the woods. And, go, and If people can make enough money, at least in England, they buy a cottage in the country so they can have a weekend place and retreat in Scandinavia on lakes and things and in the forest. I mean, this is all over Europe, or at least Northern Europe. Um, people want to get back to nature at weekends and on their summer holidays. Um, not many Europeans would choose to go on a summer holiday to the middle of Shanghai or New York. They'd think in terms of somewhere that's got forests and beaches and um, nature of, uh, you know, in places, mountains and things that are more natural. And so I think that this division, you see the, the, the romantic sense that nature's alive, that we're connected with nature through our pets, through our gardens, through our weekend cottages, through our holidays and through our retirement fantasies. I mean, a lot of English people fantasize that when they retire, they'll go and live in a cottage in an unspoiled village with hollyhocks and beautiful plants growing outside them, roses, and, and look after their garden and take their dog for a walk in surrounding fields. I mean, this is a kind of retirement fantasy that a lot of people have, and some actually put into practice. Um, and uh, so, the, d until recently, the point I'm making is that that could comfortably exist in a separate compartment. And, but now, uh, with climate change and the destruction of the environment and the Anthropocene and the extinction of countless other species through human predatory activities and through ne neoliberal economic system, extractive capitalism, um, it's become clear that we can't just separate them. The rest of the world won't just go on as it, people took for granted before, uh, as normal. The climate is changing, other species are going extinct, and the things that we, we care about in our romantic side at weekends and on holidays, we're now being forced to care about during working hours as well. Um, because we can't separate them any longer. It's become clear that we can't separate them. And the reason this is important is that it's not as if there's one lot of people who believe in destroying the environment and another lot who believe in preserving it and caring for nature. They're the same people on different days of the week. And all of us are torn between those two personas. Um, you know, when people are doing their investments, if they've got lots of money, they go and see their stockbroker. And, you know, they they put money in investment funds that give the highest profit. And until recently, that they wouldn't ask any more questions. Now, as more people are beginning to ask, well, do I really want to invest in opening up new oil fields or gas fields or investing in mining activities or plastic manufacture where the plastic will just be thrown away or uh, in, in, in investing in things that damage the environment and the planet. And an uh, increasing number of people are beginning to think, well, maybe I don't want to invest in these things, which is where another way that this attitude is crossing over into the everyday 9 to 5, Monday to Friday world. And I think that the, uh, we'll be forced to um, think more and more about these things. I mean, Extinction Rebellion is one symptom of this. Mm -hmm bringing this, you know, school children saying, what's the point of going and learning all this stuff in schools and passing exams if the planet's being destroyed all around us and by the time we're grown up and by the time we have children, you know, what use is all this knowledge if everything's just being destroyed? 
it's it, and that cuts into the nine to five school hours because they take, started striking from school, um, and it, that's another way that this is being forced into the public arena. So I think we're in a time of great change at the moment, and, and I mean the, certainly things are changing. Some are changing in the right direction. The only question is, will they change fast enough? Dr. Frederick, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you for your time. And um, to just uh, select on a more personal note that uh, your views and books have and been very, I mean, they op certainly opened up in a new perspective for me. And I'm glad that I can uh, personally thank you for that. Well, thank you. And I'm very glad that this book's coming out in Estonia. Thank you.